Okay, thank you very much, Francesco, for the, uh, for the kind introduction and, uh, for the, and to you and to Thomas uh, for inviting me to uh, chair this uh, distinguished panel. Um, for me, of course, it's, uh, it's nice to be here. It's, uh, I, I consider the SRB a bit as our home also because, I mean, as it said there, it's the European system of financial supervision, the SRB with the, with the ESAs, and we have gone through quite uh, difficult years since we started our work uh, uh, in 2011, and the commissioner yesterday mentioned uh, some, Vice President Dombrovskis mission, mentioned yesterday some adjustments to our structure, so we have always been moving in the same, in the same direction. Uh, since the SRB and the, and, the, and the EBA have been established, I think that uh, the focus on, uh, on banking has been on, let's say, more on short-term emergencies than on uh, future long-term challenges. So I, I, I take the, uh, the heading of this panel and the focus on future challenges as a signal that uh, we are to some extent uh, moving away from the uh, hot emergencies of the crisis uh, to look a little bit to, uh, to the future challenges uh, and to a longer-term structural issues. And that's, I think, a good, uh, a good, uh, a good thing. Um, However, let's say the focus, uh, sh I mean, the discussion should probably start uh, from, let's say, from the legacy. I mean, we are uh, in a transition from a system which has been deeply shocked by, by, by a crisis, by a very uh, difficult crisis, and is now moving ahead. And uh, um, so the first thing is uh, how far have we gone in addressing the, the legacy issues? Uh, uh, are we going in the right directions to uh, overcome all the problems that uh, we still have in the, in the European banking sector? And then maybe trying to uh, look ahead to the uh, uh, more, um, um, let's say, challenging issues of what uh, will be the competitive environment, how to regain efficiency, what will be the interaction between banks and new players, uh, uh, how technology can reshape uh, the uh, the future of, uh, of banking in Europe and worldwide. So with a view to uh, quickly set the stage, I would say that uh, when you talk about legacy, of course, uh, the mind of everybody goes to asset quality problems, which are still lingering uh, on, the, on, the European, uh, on the European banking sector. Uh, here, let's say, you know that we as EBA have been very vocal on the need to uh, aggressively address the issue of uh, uh, non-performing loans, um, um, and, uh, uh, and we have been complaining until recently of the uh, uh, relatively low speed in the adjustment. I mean, a, a graph that I used to always refer to is a comparison of the speed of adjustment uh, in terms of uh, uh, NPLs, of the cycle of NPLs uh, from the start of the crisis uh, to the end of the crisis, so how long do the, do, does the NPL ratio take uh, to go back to the pre-crisis level? And, uh, and uh, uh, let's say, in a sense, uh, I, uh, th there is this interesting graph that shows that in the US, the peak has been reached very fast in two years after the crisis, and then there has been a relatively fast uh, uh, reduction. Uh, so in another three years, four years, let's say, the, the pre-crisis level has been reached. At the other end of the spectrum, you have Japan, which took almost nine years to reach the peak. So there was a problem of identification that had been lingering uh, in the system for a long while. But then once the problem was identified and dealt with, there was a rather steep adjustment. And Europe, a little bit in between, with uh, four years uh, to reach the peak, and then a very slow, let's say, reduction that was really projecting a very long period of time to go back to pre-crisis level. Now, the good news is that if you look at, at the data more recently, the adjustment has taken more speed. We need to understand, uh, of course, how much this is due to uh, some idiosyncratic deals uh, or how much is taking, let's say, more uh, widespread uh, grip uh, in, the, in, the, in the system, so how far we are, we are going into addressing the problem. But this is good news, and we should take stock of it and, and discuss uh, uh, the, uh, the direction. And of course, the key question here is, uh, uh, will we manage 
to complete the adjustment process while still we have uh, ample liquidity in the market and uh, low interest rates, which is, of course, uh, an important condition to support the, the adjustment. Uh, NPLs have been one of the greatest uh, breaks on the profitability of banks, uh, not the only one, of course, low interest rates uh, and, uh, and other issues have also plugged, uh, high costs uh, have also plugged the problem of profitability. Also in the area of profitability, we see positive signals. Uh, the second quarter results have been, uh, have been more positive. But again, the, the issue here is uh, how uh, structural this recovery in profitability is and uh, has enough restructuring being made to uh, uh, ach achieve longer term viability and the return on equity, uh, uh, um, which, is, uh, which goes uh, above the cost of equity, which has not, has been, the case, has not been the case for a long, for long while. Um, the issue of low profitability, I mean, for instance, if you look at the recent data, what you see is that uh, one of the uh, main drivers of the increase in profitability has been the reduction in provisioning, which is, of course, good news, reflecting also the improvement in asset quality. Uh, but, uh, let's say, in terms of uh, revenues and in terms of costs, let's say, on average, at the European level, uh, you don't see much, uh, much change. Uh, so the, the, the issue is how we will, move, uh, we will move ahead. And what you see, and this links to the other topics, is that uh, the banks which have achieved uh, uh, better results are those which have been more effective in <coughs> cutting costs and in uh, embracing new technologies to change the way in which their products are, uh, are distributed. So how much, let's say, also the technology uh, um, challenge and uh, effectively addressing it can help banks restoring their long-term uh, profitability. This is linked also to a lot of work that the, uh, the, the, the SRB itself has done with a very interesting paper that has been published uh, a couple of years ago, if I remember well, by the uh, Advisory Scientific Committee of the, of the SRB on overbanking. So uh, have we, uh, still, uh, do we still have uh, a, an issue of overbanking in, the, in European banks? And if so, what can be done to address it? Uh, uh, and the issue of overbanking is linked with another topic, which I suppose also for our uh, bankers around the table is very uh, topical, which is uh, fragmentation in the, in, in, the, in, the, in the European banking market. So how far have we been successful in uh, providing our banks with, a, with a, an integrated domestic market in the European Union, an integrated single market in the European Union, which could be their uh, domestic base for also, let's say, uh, global expansion. I mean, uh, sometimes I hear uh, complaints, uh, more than sometimes, I must say, from, uh, from bankers saying that uh, we have not done enough to uh, remove uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the segmentations which have been uh, introduced uh, uh, during the crisis uh, to, you know, to ring fence local, local systems, uh, and we still have a lot of impediments to uh, a... a, a, a a flow of uh, liquidity and capital within, uh, within the uh, European Union. Uh, when we talk about uh, uh, higher debates on the future of the, Euro of the European Union, of the Euro area, of the, of, of the Economic and Monetary Union, we hear, for instance, President Macron talking about, uh, you know, the uh, uh, moving really to a setting in which uh, the, 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 the union is a single jurisdiction. Uh, how much are we a single jurisdiction in banking today? The banking union and the colleagues here at the ECB, Penti, uh, in, in the board of, of, the, uh, of the ECB, in the supervisory board of the ECB, is doing a lot in this respect, but how far have we gone in this direction? And finally, the issue of, uh, of uh, technologies, which I've been already alluding to. Uh, I mean, we know that, I mean, sometimes the, the, the introduction of new technologies, this fintech uh, uh, vibe is used as, uh, as a sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, imminent threat on, on, on the banks, like a, a challenge from outside that, uh, that could... Uh, derange the, uh, the adjustments in the European banking sector. But of course, uh, let's say, if you look at what is happening in the markets, you see a lot of collaboration between banks and new, uh, new startups in the technology area. Uh, and it's, it's more difficult to understand what is the, uh, what is the interaction. But definitely, uh, new technologies uh, 
let's say, impose uh, uh, to banks to reflect on their own business model and, uh, and on the, the way in which they distribute their products, but also the way in which they relate to their customers. Because we will have, for instance, if, if I think to PSD2, which is uh, uh, a, a directive on which we have been working quite a lot recently, I mean, there will be a number of new players that will be able to directly access uh, the, account, the bank accounts of uh, bank customers to provide a number of services, access to a lot of information on these customers. So how much the informational franchise that the banks have been uh, constructing their, let's say, long-term relationship with customers on will be, uh, will be uh, let's say, challenged in this uh, framework. So there are, I, I threw on the table a number of issues. We have a very distinguished panel here. We have, uh, to my left, uh, uh, Thorsten Beck, Professor of Banking and Finance at Cass Business School. Then we have uh, uh, Pentia Karainen, uh, a member of the uh, supervisory board of the ECB and, and former member of the board of the Bank of Finland. And then we have uh, two prominent bankers, two group CFOs, uh, uh, respectively uh, Heike Hilka from uh, Nordea Group uh, to the extreme uh, right there. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Jose Antonio uh, Garcia Cantera from Santander. So let's uh, start with the short presentations, I would say around 10 minutes, and then let's have an, int an interactive discussion here and then open up to the public. So I would give the floor to Thorsten first, please, as you like. Oh, this one. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, thank you for inviting me to this conference. I'm very happy to be here. Um, I have only a few slides. Uh, there are actually quite a lot of pictures in there, so don't uh, get too much worried. Um, what I would uh, like to do, and I guess that comes with the being an academic, um, I would first like to kind of take a step back and talk about uh, financial systems in the most generic way. Um, and first try to kind of give us a, a reason why we're actually standing here or sitting here uh, talking about uh, finance uh, and banking uh, in the sense that um, uh, although um, there is a large literature showing that uh, finance matters for growth more in middle than in high income countries, uh, there are certain non-linearities, um, it is still important. It is important uh, for the intermediation function, especially for SMEs. It is important for long-term investment, R&D, um, and ultimately translating into higher growth. So that's uh, something also including for uh, high-income countries. Of course, it also helps growing faster out of the crisis. Um, now, what also um, has been shown, uh, and that's actually also very relevant in, a, in, our, in the context of our discussion, is that especially within currency unions, an integrated financial system can be good for dampening volatility, for enhancing growth. Uh, integration, it comes with more competition, um, and if um, there hasn't been, there has been evidence, of course, on the, on the country level, for example, within the, the European Union, but uh, another area, another region to look at is, of course, the, the, the United States, um, which is also a currency union, which used to have a very fragmented financial system and has moved to a more integrated financial system, and there is, uh, of course, with all the fragility risks and so on, uh, there is lot, quite a lot of evidence that this has been uh, good uh, for uh, for, the, for the economy. Now, maybe you have noticed that I haven't really used the word banks or bankers yet. Why? Um, because when academic, especially academic theorists, which I'm not, um, start talking about um, financial intermediation, they start in the most generic form that you can imagine, intermediation between savers and investors, and then try to compare their theoretical concepts with what they can observe in reality. And of course, in reality, we don't just observe banks, we observe, or we have observed over history, lots of different forms. Now, we happen to have in, uh, in Europe a, bank ins a financial system which is heavily focused on banks. But just to make the case, uh, and of course, I don't, uh, at the risk of uh, insulting uh, some people in the room, including two people in the, on the panel, which without any intention, um, as academic economists, or as economists in general, we, we don't really care that much about bankers. We care about them because they are in the banks and they are the financial system. But we, primarily, we care about financial service provision. And it could be, of course, from banks, as it is today, or it could be from alternative uh, financing forms uh, at the topic which I will come back to at the very end. Now, 
this has been already mentioned, and of course, I wanted to say that uh, um, being here at an ESRB conference, it's more than appropriate to quote some ESRB research. Uh, Andrea already referred to it. Um, we've seen this uh, um, um, rapid growth um, in uh, banking, uh, especially in the years leading up to the crisis, driven by the largest banks. And I think what's also important to point out is the, the kind of the regulatory and political approach behind that. That's very important. And of course, this all ended in, in blood uh, and tears in, uh, in 2008 when the, the, the European banks or global banks were basically turned national in their, in their, their failure. Now, a lot of things have happened in between uh, over the past nine years, uh, much more than actually some of us uh, would have expected in 2008. Um, there has been a move towards a uh, currency union level regulatory framework. Uh, and of course, the question is, how successful has this been? And of course, it is still early days, so it's really far too early to make a, a final judgment. But I think there are a couple of cases, even before the introduction of the banking union, uh, that kind of can tell us um, uh, how we can think about uh, the, um, this, uh, what, what has been done so far. Um, and I just want to point to four cases. Uh, Banco Espirito Santo, um, 2014. Um, well, it shows, on the one hand, the limitation of national supervision. Um, well, maybe not just national, but in general supervision, uh, which missed basically the, uh, the deterioration in the, in the, in the holding group. Um, but the, the bail-in worked actually reasonably well, and I've done some research actually also with somebody at the EBA, Samuel uh, Roger de Lopez, and one of my PhD students, where we show basically the, the overall credit supply, the aggregate credit supply effects have actually been uh, negligible. Um, there have been some real sector effects, but overall it is, can be described as a very successful bank resolution. Um, and again, it wasn't, it was before the BRD, and it's also, it's in the spirit, but not in the letter of the BRD, in the sense that there wasn't a bail-in of 16%, um, and there was also taxpayer support, and there was also support from other banks, and the taxpayer support actually came in a, in a form of uh, an, uh, still outstanding um, credit line from the IMF. Um, what does Greece 2015 tell us um, about uh, the um, uh, Eurozone banking system? Well, it shows us that the, the, the link between uh, sovereign and uh, banks uh, is still there. And of course, you can always argue that Greece is a special case, uh, although you could also argue that, for example, um, we see similar, though not as heavy, uh, problems in, uh, in Italy, for example. Um, Banco Popular, I think that's, um, there's very little not to like about it. Uh, I think that was really almost like a textbook bank resolution. Um, I call it therefore one zero for the banking union. Um, very well done, very swiftly, no taxpayer support. As an uh, academic, of course, I can't just let it go like this. I have to make some one observation, uh, and that it's a purely national solution. It's an observation, it's not a criticism, but I'm gonna come back to this in a moment. Finally, uh, Veneto Manca, Banca Popolare di Vigenza. Um, well, that's, of course, has been heavily criticized, and uh, rightly so, uh, because uh, the, the bail-in uh, the, the bail did not go all the way up to the 16% uh, to avoid uh, taxpayer support, which had to be brought in, uh, which basically didn't go around the letter, but around the spirit um, of the um, of the BRD. And of course, also um, tells us, and that's actually the first thing I wanna point out, that the legacy problems, and Andrea mentioned these already, are still there. Uh, the legacy problem of an overhang of non-performing loans and of underperforming banks. So it's not just about the NPLs, it's also about the banks. Um, now, of course, this kind of matches or mirrors an approach that um, has been seen, has been a problem in the Eurozone from the very beginning, not just on the banking level, but also the fiscal level, this kind of asymmetry between creditors made, being made whole and debtors having to pay no matter what. We've also seen, and of course, Cyprus is again the most uh, prominent example, to a certain extent Spain, uh, that a pure solution on the national level um, has not always been possible but then has also led, for example, in the case of these two Italian banks I just mentioned, to a, um, um, a delay, a protraction in the, uh, in the resolution, which of course has made things worse. And of course, uh, Andrea already mentioned the, uh, the Japan crisis, uh, which is kind of the textbook example of how not to, uh, how to, how to prevent addressing, um, how to not ad address pranking problems uh, uh, in time. Now this has led to calls, um, and I'm, I think I leave this for the next session to kind of address this in a more systematic way, as actually um, several economists have kind of um, uh, pointed to that, to create some kind of asset management company, which existed, have existed already on the national level, but also would be, um, might be good for on the uh, Eurozone level, including the EBA has uh, picked up on that. Um, the only point I want to make is, it's not just about the NPL, it's also about the, uh, the, the bank uh, restructuring. Ultimately, where we want to get to is from national banking systems, 
where a Spanish bank is resolved with the help of another Spanish bank or an Italian bank is uh, resolved with the help of another Italian bank to a Eurozone banking system where one Eurozone bank maybe will be resolved by, with the help, with a merger of another Eurozone uh, bank, not necessarily from the, from the same country. Or when we're finally at a point where Deutsche, Societe Generale, or um, uh, Unicredit are not considered anymore German, French, or Italian, but Eurozone banks, I think that's um, where we are really at a European uh, banking system. So regular, enormous regulatory pro uh, pros process, uh, progress, I would say, um, but I think the, this is just the kind of the underpinning for what we ultimately want, to a uh, to in form of a real banking union back to the single banking market or not back to but create a single banking market in the eurozone now a lot has been said about the banking union missing a part and i would actually say yes that's uh, that is true um, there's the funding mechanism is missing um, which of course um, comes also together with this kind of illusion that people have, especially politicians have appealed to, that there will be no more bailouts under no circumstances. We all know that it's, this is not true, and maybe it's also not healthy to kind of create this uh, illusion. Um, but ultimately, if you want to get to a Eurozone level banking system, I think we do need also the, the final uh, pillar in there, which is some kind of funding mechanism, which I know is being built up. The question is, is it sufficient? The question is, is the the, 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 fund, the public backstop, which is somewhat there through the back door, whether it's actually sufficient or not. And of course, the ultimate question is, is it really feasible to move to a new regulatory framework without cleaning up the legacy problem first? And I think the Italian case has shown that this is not possible, because as long as you don't know where this bail level that actually sits, you can't really um, uh, move to a system where you can easily bail them in. My last slide, um, and I'm coming now back to kind of a theme that I started out with uh, when I talked about finance. Um, yes, we should look beyond, beyond banks, and of course the, the capital market union agenda has been, uh, or the idea of a capital market union has been on the agenda for quite some time. Um, unlike the uh, banking union, it's actually not ne relying necessarily on having all this, uh, the components in the place at the same time. There can be can come in at the different points in time. And of course, it's a much longer term process because it especially applies also uh, moving towards more, towards one jurisdiction, as uh, Andrea just uh, uh, pointed out. And it's, it's also politically, of course, a very difficult part. But it's not just about public capital markets. It's also about other forms of uh, private intermediaries, such as uh, equity funds, venture capital funds, which are also underdeveloped in Europe compared, for example, to the other side um, of the uh, Atlantic. And of course, in this context, uh, fintech is important. Um, my take on fintech is very easy. Um, the proof is in the pudding, and I mean it's actually literally. As long as the fintech hasn't gone through the whole cycle until the very sweet or bitter end, I think this, it's too early to make a, a, a statement on that. But having said this, um, more competition in this context, I would say, is better. But of course, that implies, which I think is an important lesson for regulators, a certain flexibility in terms of how to define the regulatory parameter. And we've seen this, uh, a lot has been written about the US, for example, money market funds, which were outside the, uh, the, the regulatory parameter in 2008 had to be brought in overnight, basically, um, which, of course, something we want to avoid in this context. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thorsten. I would now give the floor to uh, Penti. Uh, Thank you, Andrea. Um, <clears throat> first, uh, let me thank uh, the organizers uh, for inviting me in, in this panel and, uh, and uh, share some thoughts with you. I, I took up uh, two areas. One is uh, that the legacy problem, NPLs, and uh, the other is, uh, is um, yeah, bank uh, profitability. Could I have a remote controller? What I say <coughs> now is uh, broadly in line with the paper I, 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 I wrote, and that is uh, in, uh, in the website at your disposal. And, um, and uh, I'm not uh, reading uh, the paper line by line, just uh, the main points there. And you know, I learned this morning, and will learn this morning, what is, what is uh, like being uh, between a, a hard place and rock, or rock and hard place. And that is because I have prominent bankers here, so I should be very careful what I say about bank profitability. 
<coughs> Let me start with uh, with uh, NPLs, and uh, it is uh, it is very true that we ended up with. Uh, high piles of uh, non-performing exposures with banks. Uh, and uh, and uh, there, when looking into this slide, you may notice that uh, the problem is spread unevenly, very unevenly. It is not uh, something which is, uh, is uh, affecting all, all markets. Uh, the weighted average of uh, non-performing exposures is uh, uh, around 6%. Uh, uh, however, there are uh, banks uh, or countries, even with uh, non-performing ratio assets, uh, uh, ratios uh, uh, to assets above 40%. And uh, in uh, too many countries, that is uh, above, above 10%. So what does this tell you or tell me? What is, uh, first is that uh, there, there are banks who have been able to manage this issue quite well. And, um, and um, either they have been very good in, in managing their loan portfolios uh, in the, in the run-up to the crisis, or alternatively, they have been good in clean, cleaning up, uh, up uh, this uh, this mess. Also, in in troubled economies, we can see that there are banks who who have managed uh, quite well. So it is not something which uh, you can blame only external factors. What what is crucial to note that we are here with this problem now, and we need to go forward and uh, and. Uh, it is exactly what the uh, chair said. There's a slow progress in this uh, this uh, respect, uh, uh, solving the problem, and uh, partly that is because our our low low incentives in in the environment or low interest uh, rate uh, uh, environment. Uh, it is easy to keep uh, bad assets in balance sheets or take various arrangements. And, um, and uh, there's uh, perhaps uh, less uh, incentives than uh, perhaps 20, 20 years ago. Um, this is a big economical concern. And uh, that is uh, not only on a macro level, uh, where uh, major NPL stock is uh, hindering good uh, banking business, prudent banking business, uh, using capacity to finance a real economy, but it is also on a micro level uh, when it hits uh, banks' profitability, and it is also what is important. And my own experience was uh, uh, from uh, from late 90s when I was a real bank. You now I'm a central bank. Uh, that time we saw that uh, it may distract managers' time uh, from uh, something which is more important. And uh, solutions where you create bad bank and uh, and uh, good bank, and uh, then very clear distinction there. Uh, have shown that uh, that uh, it has importance. Uh, what I'm saying also is that it is a very important reminder that uh, this problem is uh, something banks own, the banking industry. Of course, it is it is very important that we we find uh, ways how to facilitate uh, the problem solving and. Uh, and uh, yesterday, the ECB president took it up by, by saying that uh, government should be playing a role in, in, in facilitating, perhaps through better insolvency procedures and various ways, uh, to this uh, problem solving. When thinking how to solve it, wh wh what is also important is, uh, is perhaps to look what is the uh, Root of the current situation, and um, and um, I already, already referred to that uh, with uh, this uh, diversity of, of problem in, in various countries and in, in in various banks. There are studies made, good research made, that it was unavoidable, un 
avoidable in, in some countries. Uh, I'm now referring to Tringales and uh, some other researchers, and uh, they have good arguments that it was perhaps a more macroeconomic uh, slowdown rather than uh, irros irresponsible credit boom um, created by banks. And uh, they may say that that is uh, not banks' fault. They, they, they are right to, to some, some extent. Personally, that is not my, my reading, having been a banker myself. Banking is uh, with risks, and uh, you need to, uh, to manage those, and uh, then prudent way of running banking is, is uh, of course, needed. And should we ac then accept that uh, then public intervention will take care of, of cleaning the mess, it, we will have a, a, a wrong long-term incentives, and, uh, and uh, that problem easily arises. I don't want to be too aggressive here. I'm, I'm for all those solutions, initiatives, which have been on the table. But the problem I see there is that uh, supposing that the bank uh, knows that uh, having this, uh, this problem with uh, um, bad assets, there's uh, a public authority or, uh, or governments uh, providing a solution, I will wait. And, uh, this may slow down uh, um, solving this problem. And uh, based on uh, experience we, we had in Nordic countries and uh, very severe banking crisis was that uh, uh, time, of, uh, time is of essence. You need to do uh, actions swiftly. It was, um, it was um, perhaps a sort of a survival of the fittest. Uh, it was not a very, very beautiful situation early 90s, but banks had to, had to act. Well, uh, let me go to, to, to the uh, profitability. I know that uh, NPLs are dealt in the next panel in detail, and that CIPRI, for example, will take, take care of complementing what I said. Now, relating to mm, banks' uh, profitability, it is, it is so that that is not only NPLs, but also, also uh, revenue side in, 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 in the normal course of, of, of business. The banks need to find ways to cut costs and increase uh, revenues. Uh, I recognize that recently it has been a tough uh, situation with, uh, with uh, very uh, tight uh, net uh, uh, interest rate uh, margin, and, uh, and um, it is, it is uh, leading to poor profitability in many cases. Now it looks that uh, improvement in terms of return on equity uh, can be forecast. Uh, it was 4.4 two years ago. Last year it was uh, 3.2 um, on the average uh, on, on, on uh, big uh, financial institutions uh, in in euro area, and uh, they forecast that it could go up to 7.4. That is that is good. That is a modest increase, and uh, and uh, not perhaps meeting the uh, required return on equity, but anyway, good direction. Um, it will. Uh, uh, continue to continue to be a problem for banks uh, uh, anyway uh, how to generate uh, more profits and um, one way is in this kind of environment where you have quite tight uh, core source of income to find um, some other uh, revenues like uh, commission and fee income uh, then you need to cut costs and here as an former bank, uh, I take up a cost-income ratio, which is widely used, and it is good revealing where we have uh, inefficiencies running the bank. But that, that is not uh, uh, perhaps uh, without flaws. There are three flaws in cost-income ratio for, um, for bankers uh, um, practi practicing the business. One is that uh, it doesn't take into account risk, 
The second is that it may mistreat or treat not properly, correctly, uh, investments in the future like marketing, development, A and R and D and uh, those issues which create cost. And third is that the, it doesn't take into account what is the income like. Here we see, and uh, one German banker told me that uh, you see the DE, that is uh, Germany, and the one German banker said that should I be able to transfer my business, business into Italy, it would be twice as profitable as it is today. And uh, it is not exactly what you can see here, but you can perhaps uh, make a conclusion that in Italy, net interest uh, uh, rate margin is, is, uh, is bigger. Okay, all, all this said, there are a lot of uh, opportunities for bankers to improve cost efficiency and uh, the new technology will give uh, new tools and it is very, very different compared to what we saw in, in the 90s. Now, for example, IT systems are in use based on volumes. That time it was huge investments in hardware and all that stuff, uh, um, fixed costs. And now you can run a bank starting it uh, with uh, no, no investments in IT. So to conclude, banks must be bold in, 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 in uh, solving the bad asset problem and bold in, in investing in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Pendi. Heike, please. Thank you. Uh, my angle to this is probably actually starting to look at uh, the challenging in cross-border banking operations in, in Europe. Uh, as you probably all have heard, uh, we have recently decided to uh, change the domicile of, of Nordea from Sweden to Finland. And the background for that is actually that uh, Nordea's home market is Nordic countries. Nordics looking as a whole is actually the 10th largest economy in the world. Uh, Nordics, however, consists of four different countries, which are Finland, Sweden, Norway and Denmark. Uh, to us, this is, however, sort of we consider Nordics as one market, as there are historical and cultural reasons uh, for understanding that actually the uh, market environment, the business climate is pretty similar in all these four Nordic countries. Nordea, the name actually stands for Nordic ideas, and, and the current Nordea was actually established in 2001 when we combined all these four Nordic countries. So Nordea as a bank is actually a teenager right now. Uh, we, are, we have been there since 2001, and we are a bit unique in the Nordic space in that sense that we are a truly pan-Nordic player. So we operate in one, one single Nordic market. Uh, the, reason, the historical <coughs> reasons for Nordics being a one single market is actually that if you go back a few centuries, uh, actually almost all the Nordic countries in some day and age have been part of actually Sweden. Uh, then there have been changes uh, over the years and there have been sort of uh, wars fought between the countries at certain phases, but all Nordic countries actually share the same uh, culture, the same values, and to a large extent also the same uh, legal environment as well on a high level. And, and that provides then sort of uh, a stable operating environment to operate in the Nordic space. But then when we look a, a bit deeper in the environment, we actually notice that out of these four Nordic countries, uh, three out of those countries are part of uh, European Union. One out of those four countries is part of the Eurozone and thereby also part of the banking union. But all four Nordic countries, they are actually part of the European single market. And if we start with the sort of uh, basic ideas of the European single market and understanding that all the four Nordic countries are part of the European single market, it should actually not make any difference that where do we place our headquarters among these four Nordic countries. That is the sort of the idealistic view where we should actually be. But then actually looking at the realities of life where we actually operate, we actually deal with four different Nordic countries having 
differing rules even among the three uh, Nordic countries which are part of the European Union. So we share the same European Union legislation, but as there are also exemptions <coughs> in place, then in real life situations, we see diverging rules affecting us in the Nordic space, which we uh, consider to be one single Nordic market. Uh, the downside of that is naturally then that, okay, as different Nordic countries impose different type of rules to our operations, even in this same single uh, market space, uh, then we expose these rules also to our operation across the borders. We changed our legal structure actually at the beginning of this year to a, a one bank structure where we have a, a parent company in Sweden and we operate through branches in other Nordic countries. We actually now aligned our legal structure with our operating model, which has been in place since the establishment of Nordea in 2001. So since the beginning of Nordea, since the beginning of the history of Nordea, we have always operated as one bank, but we still had sort of uh, differences in terms of what our legal structure was. And now we have then aligned our legal structure with our operating model, operating one single market. And then we actually emerged many of these issues when we noticed or actually sort of uh, increased the problems with diverging set of rules in these different Nordic countries. To us, it's important that we can operate as, as one bank. We can operate in a stable and predictable environment, and we can play with the same set of rules that provide us level playing field so that we can compete against our peers in a sort of uh, orderly fashion. It's actually then question about, uh, if you look at different rules, I, I would actually not focus that much of on sort of looking at that, what exactly are the rules. I've always said that uh, when you look at different rules sort of that you can have lengthy uh, debates about that, what should the rules look like and, and what is better rules and should you change something or, or something like that. But to me it's actually the rules are like in a card game. When you are playing cards it actually doesn't matter that much what are the rules. You can sort of figure out whatever rules as long as you agree about the rules before you start to hand out the cards and each and every player understands the rules in a similar manner, and each and every player plays with the same set of rules. Then you will have a great card game. If not, it will be a mess. And that is actually the point that uh, it's not that important to look at that, okay, what are actually the rules, as long as all play with the same set of rules, and you can, through the entire card game, then expect that the rules maintain are maintained the same. If there are changes sort of that, okay, then there has to be an orderly process as well for that. But that's not what we have seen. And that then naturally led to a situation where we were forced to review that where do we place our domicile. And once again, I uh, <coughs> repeat that that's not something that you should be forced to do when you're operating in European single market. Sort of the basic freedom of establishment <coughs> and the single European market should allow you to sort of establish your headquarters wherever and it would not make any difference. But in our case, that uh, made a difference. And that was the reason why we then made the decision that we want to play with the same set of rules. From our perspective, let's say in the wider media, it was probably debated that it was question about sort of selecting between Finland or Denmark. As we said that uh, when we will be moving our headquarters, we will still say stay within the Nordic countries naturally as that is our home market. We excluded Norway due to the fact that it was not a member of the European Union. So we had then Finland and Denmark left. But it was actually not a decision or choice between Finland or Denmark. It was actually a choice between being part of banking union or not. And, and that made it almost like a no-brainer then in the end when we are reviewing different alternatives. And that's why we decided that we will change the domicile and move our headquarters to Finland. What happened during the process is actually then, uh, then both the Danish and Swedish government actually also started to discuss about the potential of uh, joining banking union as well. I personally think that uh, that is the only way to go. And in the longer term, I would expect that actually all uh, Nordic countries which are part of the European Union are also part of the banking union. And, and that should be the only way to go to ensure that we have uh, 
level playing field among all the Nordic countries. Then looking at otherwise, uh, the things that are happening in the sort of banking space otherwise, probably fintech uh, is the word, almost sort of buzzword or hype word, which is commonly used, which is a key part of banking in the future. But to us actually looking at fintech, we get a lot of questions that are you afraid of fintechs? Will fintechs take over your business? Uh, will it be a disaster for incumbent banks and all that? To me, this sounds like a di uh, discussion that we would have 20 years ago that someone would have asked that will the internet take over banking? And we can laugh at that right now, but uh, occasionally the discussion about fintechs sort of has, has similarities to that. To us uh, and me personally, fintech is not a question about companies. I would not talk about fintech companies. It's a question about the technology, fintech financial technology. And I would argue that that is part of each and every successful bank's business <coughs> right now as of today. <coughs> if not, then you don't have a viable business model going for the future. But it's, it's actually a question about also joining forces. I would not see fintechs, the fintech companies, as a threat to uh, incumbent banks. At least to us, we consider uh, fintechs to be uh, valuable partners to us. Uh, we must find uh, ways to join forces. We are all the time exploring new technologies. We are benefiting from a cooperation with several different fintech companies. And there are a lot of interesting technologies, a lot of interesting ideas, which will sooner or later be actually part of the everyday business of each and every bank on a longer term. So I just embrace the in fintechs right now. The challenge there as well is naturally also that a lot of fintech uh, companies are actually now operating outside the regulated business. And, and then again, uh, if we uh, have a market where we have different players playing with different set of rules, we end up in trouble once again. <coughs> and that is probably the issue I would like to address that if irrespective of what is the uh, legacy of, of different players in the market or what is the ownership structure or the exact business model. But if we are competing uh, with the in the same market with the same services, we should also play with the same set of rules as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heike. Jose, you have Right, well, thank you very much. Thank you for the uh, invitation to participate in the conference. I have a, uh, a, um, a short presentation. Uh, the uh, drawback of uh, speaking the last is that some of the topics have already been covered. Uh, so I will go uh, quick and focus on a few uh, key ideas. Um, well, clearly banks in Europe are not making their cost of equity. Um, cost of equity has been relatively flat at 10% in the last seven, eight years, and it's not coming down. And this may be puzzling the regulators and the supervisors, but the reality is that despite the banks being more capitalized and having uh, TLAC and MREL, et cetera, et cetera, uh, cost of equity is at 10% and it's not coming down. And on average, banks are not reaching this level. I would... Uh, uh, differentiate, though, between larger institutions and smaller institutions. Smaller banks will have it increasingly difficult to compete. Um, just issuing, complying with, uh, complying with uh, MREL, for instance, a very small bank may pay up to five times what we have to pay for a tier two, or obviously more than double what we have to pay for an 81. So the financial cost associated uh, with complying with the regulatory requirements are going to be significantly more demanding for the smaller institutions. Or in terms of investments, just uh, meeting all this technology or embracing of, of these new technologies will make it uh, very dear for them. Uh, just to give you an idea, we invest in new technologies, the amount an amount which is more than the equity of 95% of European banks every year. So for a small bank to uh, reach the amount of investment that we are making is just outright impossible. One also key, uh, two key ideas here. Uh, uh, structurally, 
um, we um, have to comply with significantly increased regulatory costs and uh, it will take time before these requirements are passed on to clients. So regulators have to get used to banks not making the cost of capital for a while. And we will, I will talk about this later. Second, um, I put weak credit demand as a cyclical um, um, factor where we are not sure. The key uh, element why banks are not making their cost of equity is very, very weak credit demand. And we don't know <coughs> if this is a structural or cyclical. We just wish it's cyclical and that eventually we will see more credit demand, but the fact is that credit demand today is very weak and we need policies that work on both the supply and the demand side of credit demand, of credit, sorry. Fintechs, totally agree with uh, what has been said. So far, fintechs have focused on payments, data analytics, and lending. Um, obviously, this is forcing us to enhance customer um, experience, cost efficiency, etc. Very limited impact on revenues. Um, and they face three main uh, challenges. One is scalability. Lending has always been free. Anyone can start lending with no re regulatory requirements. But obviously, if you want to grow your lending, you need funding for that. And in order to make it stable, you need deposits. And that's regulated. <coughs> and second, the question of maturity transformation. Who is going to do maturity transformation? Um, Key here is, as, uh, as uh, Heike said, uh, we all need to have the same regulatory requirements. We need a level playing field to compete so that if taking the policies is regulated, it should be regulated for everybody. Uh, and I agree completely that the uh, way to work forward is by collaborating with these uh, companies, not competing uh, with, them, with them. But again, just you know, we, uh, for instance, in our case, we are investing over 2 billion euros in technology every year, new technology every year. Consolidation. Much has been, uh, in order to have a consolidated uh, or, a, a, or a more integrated banking system, we need uh, consolidation in Europe. Well, these are the trends. And if we uh, judge how successful consolidation has been, it's been not very successful. Um, you see here in terms of number of transactions and in terms of the value of these transactions, and this is ECB numbers, how um, uh, cross-border M&A has been in Europe. Uh, so if we judge by these, it's been not very successful and it's actually getting worse. Why is that? Well, the European banking system is very fragmented, and we've uh, talked about that, and I think you know, everybody has covered that, and I totally agree that uh, banking union is uh, not complete, and I think there is a great opportunity to uh, advance in the integration of uh, banking in, uh, in Europe um, to have really a, a single banking market. When we talk about data like MPLs, et cetera, et cetera, we are not really comparing apples and oranges. We are comparing a country, which is the US, a country, which is Japan, and many different countries, which is Europe. We are not comparing a country with a country. So uh, for many, many reasons, uh, in, uh, advance, uh, moving forward in, in terms of the banking union is great. Also, there are other factors like uh, supervisory barriers and uh, well, banking systems in Europe we just heard are ring-fenced, and um, uh, unless we break that, uh, for that we need you know, lots of new, um, uh, and I'll, I'll move forward here, we need uh, some of the, of the things that I say here, we, we need to advance in integrating legally uh, many different um, uh, laws, uh, and also the banking union, capital markets union, uh, etc. Another factor that is making it very difficult to integrate banking, banks in Europe is ownership structure. Uh, you can see here the ownership structure of European banks. 40% of European banks are non 
privately owned. They are either cooperative banks or public sector banks. In terms of assets, in France, 55% of assets are cooperative banks or public sector banks. In Germany, almost 50%. In the Netherlands, uh, more than 50%. So when we talk about integrating, are we talking about two big banks merging? Or are we really talking about integrating banking systems? Also, having these very significant differences in ownership structures puts additional pressure on profitability. W do cooperative or public banks have the same incentives as uh, private banks to make their cost of equity? <coughs> I mean, we've seen very low profitability in Germany. Germany has 1,600 banks, and many, most of them are publicly owned. Do they have the same incentives to reach cost of equity? As the public sector, uh, as the privately owned banks do, so so these are questions that I think are uh, important to reflect upon. Regulatory uncertainty. Well, when we talk about TILAC, for instance, uh, we've heard uh, of many uh, many different figures in terms of the amount of MREL TILAC instruments that are still to be issued. If we look at the entire banking system in Europe, we've seen figures as high as 1 trillion euros of 81 tier 2 and senior non-preferred or holding <coughs> senior debt to be issued. This is a huge amount of money. And the big banks will be able to meet our requirements. We are, you know, we and other European banks are accessing the market very easily. Uh, but will all banks be able to meet these requirements and at what cost? Um, well, finally, uh, just some uh, conclusions again. Supply and demand policies to stimulate, uh, to stimulate uh, credit growth are absolutely key. Um, we need to uh, move forward in the banking union. We need to finalize the, bank, the, finalize, uh, the banking union and enhance the single root book. Uh, I would recommend that we continuously assess the unintended consequences of all the regulatory requirements that have been implemented in the last few years. And we need a level playing field uh, with the new entrants to preserve financial stability and protect customer needs. Thank you very much. OK, thank you very much. I think we had uh, quite a number of issues thrown on the table. Let me try to maybe first uh, have a round of uh, discussions in the panel and before opening to the, uh, to the floor. To, um, to maybe um, put some questions, some additional questions, some more refined questions, let's say, on the table. I mean, the first one, the first theme that I perceive we have uh, is uh, uh, one that uh, uh, Thorsten first uh, raised, um, uh, but which relates to many things that uh, emerged also in the discussion, which is uh, this point, uh, you know, uh, of differences in uh, the setting for exit from the market. So resolution and the like, so international in life, national in death and the like. I mean, here I'm always a bit, uh, uh, I mean, this, uh, this famous sentence from Mervyn King, although I think originally it was uh, Tom Huertas who made it, but um, uh, is, has captured a lot of attention. But actually in Europe, we had a lot of, you know, uh, European uh, funds which have been deployed uh, uh, by the uh, ESM in dealing with uh, uh, banking crises in uh, Ireland, for instance, in Spain, in, uh, in, uh, in Portugal, in Greece, and the like. Uh, nonetheless, let's say, we have the impression that uh, uh, the way in which this has been done has not been creating a common safety net, and we are still there. And when I hear, for instance, uh, the chairwoman of the Single Resolution Board, El Elke Koenig, saying that resolution is for the few, not for the many, um, and notice in the fact that liquidation remains basically uh, national to a large extent, I wonder whether we are in a place where we still have a, a, a framework for exit from the market that is, uh, uh, let's say, uh, the right one for a, a, a truly unified market. Because again, and this links very much to the issue of cross-border banking, because whenever you talk amongst authorities, uh, about uh, barriers to cross-border banking, uh, the, the key concern of host authorities is if things go wrong, 
uh, uh, the bill will be uh, will be on my on my account. Will be uh, my taxpayers would have to foot the bill. My deposit guarantee scheme would have to foot the bill. So how can we let's say really move to a more integrated let's say um, framework for uh, for uh, crisis management? Here I, I would like to refer to uh, a couple of papers which I always found very interesting by Daniel Gross, who showed how. Uh, let's say the crisis in uh, uh, Nevada and Puerto Rico in the, in the US have been addressed and now they've been addressed in Ireland and Greece. Uh, noticing that there were a lot of similarities in the type of issue. In one case, uh, more a sovereign problem, Puerto Rico uh, contaminating the banks, and in another case, uh, more a banking issue, let's say affecting the finances of the, uh, of the state. Um, uh, very similar size, but in, 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 both, uh, in both cases in the US, having the FDIC entering into the banks, let's say, during the weekend, uh, taking control of the banks, uh, working them out, selling them to banks coming from other states, uh, taking up the assets, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, without basically the customers noticing. How can we move maybe to that setting is, is I think, a, a, a key point, and how much cross-border obstacles to cross-border banking should be addressed also through this uh, channel. A, a second point which I think was emerging, which was interesting in my view, is the, um, is this issue of, uh, uh, let's say, the, um, or, or maybe let me say, staying on the cross-border banking issue. I, I hear and sympathize with this uh, uh, request from bankers to really deliver a truly homogeneous, uh, let's say, set of rules, a really integrated framework for regulatory and supervisory framework for banks in the, in the union and, and the like. Um, here, uh, however, we need to be uh, realistic. I mean, we, we, we started with, uh, uh, for instance, negotiating all the packages uh, of legislation that we have now in place, implementing the G20 reforms in a pre-banking union uh, setting, and we will not be, uh, we still have a number of areas in which we have different international implementations, different rules locally. There are areas which are not even banking regulations which are uh, insolvency laws uh, and the like. So here it would be important for me to understand whether you could give us a little bit more ideas of priorities. I mean, which are the areas where, let's say, having uh, greater homogeneity in rules would really help cross-border banking, help the integration, the integration of the market? And finally, I would say there is this, this large, small point, uh, bank's point that uh, uh, Jose especially raised. I mean, here I think we have a tension between two attitudes. So on the one hand, you have uh, the point that uh, is uh, more and more raised in the debate that uh, on the one hand, regulatory reforms have generated a very complex environment, which for smaller banks is uh, close to unmanageable in terms of uh, compliance costs in particular. And, uh, um, and therefore, there is a strong uh, push to move towards a setting like in the US, a sort of you know, two-tier system in which you differentiate the, uh, the requirements for uh, uh, large cross-border banks and, uh, and smaller, uh, small local players. Uh, so the proportionality debate, which is uh, very, 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 very high. On the other hand, let's say looking also at your discussion on, of, uh, uh, of ownership structures, there is sometimes the impression that uh, very entrenched positions of local players, uh, uh, non-contestable in terms of ownership structures and the like, uh, generates a, a problem in terms of entry uh, across borders, competition, and uh, a real integration in the system. So which direction should we go? Should we crystallize these differences in regulation, or should we try to move away from these differences? Uh, this, I think, also is, a, is, an, interesting, uh, is an interesting question. Um, uh, on the, on the, let me close on the, on the fintech point. Um, I mean, the, 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 the vibe that comes out from the first round of discussion is always uh, uh, very, uh, is very positive that uh, fintech is an opportunity. There are, uh, it will be a steep challenge for new entrants, let's say, to, uh, let's say, to scale up activities to the level of banks and, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, let's say uh, banks can cooperate with these entities so that there is a cooperation rather than competition mode that could be maybe more important. Still, let's say I'm still 
let's say, uh, what are really uh, the, the challenges? I mean, there will be winners and losers. Whenever you have a technological change, there are winners and losers. And uh, so uh, uh, where will be the, the, the losers here? And how can we try to prepare on, on, the, uh, on, the, uh, on the possible problems that uh, the losers will face if they don't, don't move fast enough? Another point which we have not raised is uh, uh, the, the cost. And, 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 and for instance, think of uh, cyber risk. I mean, cyber risk is, is uh, uh, coming up in the, in the list of priorities for a lot of banks. Many of you are starting with penetration tests and the like. Uh, I mean, in, in this area, of course, this will mean that uh, costs will also uh, come up to some extent. Uh, but uh, banks deal with information to a large extent. So how can we... Uh, I mean, do we have an, an environment, should we do more in this area also as uh, policy makers to try to follow this, uh, this, uh, this path and, uh, and to uh, uh, try to understand and push banks to, to prepare uh, fast enough for the, for the new challenges in this area. So let me open the floor to, to those of you who want to take, the, take, take up some of these themes or others as you like. Penti, please. Thank you. Yeah. From Jose Antonio, I will <coughs> take two issues, uh, very important, uh, to distinguish what is cyclical and what is uh, structural in terms of, of, uh, of uh, analyzing bank profitability. And it, uh, it uh, gives then uh, perhaps a uh, uh, base for draw conclusions how to go forward. But that is very, very important. All we expect and uh, hope that there will be a positive macroeconomic uh, uh, development, but, but even in that case, uh, structural uh, inefficiencies do not disappear. And that is a that is very good point. One point which uh, uh, relates to fintech and, uh, and uh, perhaps also what, what is the role of small banks and uh, this uh, regulation, and uh, there <coughs> we had a uh, seminar and, uh, and uh, there a young engineer gave a speech and um, with ponytail and, uh, and um, very new startup guy saying that uh, I'm just wondering why bankers are complaining regulation. I'm an engineer, I don't know what is banking that much but I made this startup which was bought by a Spanish uh, bank uh, but uh, he made it and uh, got a ba banking license. There were difficult criteria to meet. But you know, when I met all those criteria, I got uh, the entire global market for me. I was treated as uh, incumbent banks. And it was like a sort of uh, IT platform with, with it, with, which gives uh, global access. And uh, he was uh, speaking for regulation, perhaps uh, Along, along the lines what uh, Heike said, that when you know what the rules are, then you can play cards. Uh, another point which uh, Torsten and the chair took up, uh, the, what is the exit from the market and, uh, and how, how to do it, and how to do it in an orderly manner, that we are in between two fires, uh, we need to move swiftly and, uh, and, uh, and perhaps take risks and, and uh, then it could cause distortions. Uh, one issue what I think is that uh, do we expect too much from authorities and uh, do, do authorities think that they can really manage banking business in a way they can take care of, 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 of taking um, businesses out of the market and uh, there I, I think that we need to compare what is uh, taking place in the US and what is taking place in, in Europe and uh, in US there's a special professional uh, uh, people group, uh, group of, of those who are taking care of that as a consultants and, uh, and doing it for FDIC and, uh, and based on assignment. So that is uh, just uh, the idea that uh, whether we should uh, leave that more in the hands of, of private markets and uh, let the market forces to, to play. Those uh, two issues, uh, I 
just as a remark. Thanks. Thank you, Haki. I think I have Thorsten and then Jose. Thorsten. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, just a few points to follow up. Um, um, on the fintech, I very much liked, I forgot who it actually was, uh, who mentioned that, um, it was either Jose Antonio or Heike, um, on that uh, you have to distinguish between the fintech as a technology and uh, fintech as a, a business segment. I think that's a very valid point. Um, now, I also take the point that it's about collaboration, not necessarily competition, but I guess that you can say about everything in the financial system. I mean, so this whole debate on whether market or bank-based systems are better, I think we are kind of have moved beyond that. Uh, and we need both, um, uh, and they work together quite a lot. I mean, uh, a, a banking system cannot work without uh, uh, functioning capital markets. So I think it's more the question um, that through the disruption of fintech, um, yes, there will be winners and losers. Um, I don't know who they will be, otherwise I probably would make a lot of money with that. Um, but um, it could be, winners could be one bank or maybe some other uh, institution. Um, I mean, just comparing it to a setting that I um, know a little bit, uh, a developing country, Kenya, where a telephone company actually is uh, one of the big winners of the, the fintech uh, uh, revolution by offering mobile money services. Um, and I guess the other question is, um, so there will be winners and losers. Uh, it's uh, too early to say who it is. Um, um, it could be one bank, um, it could be new entrants. Um, and of course the other question is also who will be regulated, uh, to which extent will they stay inside or outside the regulatory parameters. Um, on the point on regulatory requirements, um, I guess there's always this trade-off between having simple rules, um, such as leverage ratio, for example, and having more complicated rules uh, and complicated systems um, that kind of try to regulate according to risk. Um, and there's a trade-off. Um, and of course, um, many economists have pointed out that maybe it's just better to go for higher capital requirements rather than to complicate uh, the regulatory system further and further to thousands of pages. Um, now, I want to make the link in Jose Antonio's last two slides, um, because in the last slide you said um, the regulatory requirements are a burden. On the penultimate slide, you said, well, we need more merchant acquisition. I think there might be a link here, um, actually, by um, uh, forcing um, certain mergers um, through this process of uh, regulatory uh, reform. Um, on the third one, the exit options, um, uh, yeah, that's a very good question, um, whether they should be purely market-driven. Um, or there should be actually more of an activist approach by the supervisors in terms of bank restructuring. I mean, that's partly the idea behind the, uh, this kind of uh, AMC, the asset management company that uh, some of us uh, have been proposing to kind of uh, more actively uh, drive this uh, bank restructuring process that we need and uh, that also can help reduce the, um, the, uh, uh, the overbanking. A uh, very final point I want to make is um, uh, one thing is mergers, yes. Uh, the other thing is... Uh, in complete um, kind of assimil assimilation of banking systems, but I'm not quite sure whether we really want to go there. I mean, it has been in the, uh, in the banking literature now more and more points on diversity can also be good, because if everybody is diversified exactly the same way, we have a problem in the crisis, because everybody's exposed to exactly the same risk. So having a certain a degree of diversity, I think, can be very helpful, and I don't think it's necessarily a contradiction uh, to having one single banking market. Thanks. Please. Yes. yes, a few uh, very quick comments on, on the fact that the popular resolution process was purely local. Uh, what I would say is the process is the same for everybody. The fact that Santander ended up buying popular doesn't mean that the resolution process was domestic. No, it was not. The process was open for everybody. Obviously, in these processes where you intervene an institution and in order to avoid um, you know, volatility, uh, et cetera, you need to react very, very quickly, domestic institutions have an edge. But the framework was uh, uh, common and was open for all banks, not just domestic banks. The fact that Santander <laughs> bought it is, not, is nothing to do with the way the framework was set up. Uh, in this case. Can I, sorry, Jose Antonio, no, this is very interesting. And, uh, and the point which I found interesting, for instance, and maybe Federico Signorini can confirm it, is that, for instance, also in the Italian case, what I understand that there is that there have been also foreign banks uh, uh, checking the books of the banks. Uh, then eventually it was an Italian bank uh, buying in the portfolio, but there, it was open 
also to foreign institutions. So I also wonder whether the fact that you have more domestic consolidation is maybe natural in the first phase of the adjustment in a setting in which you have uh, excess capacity. So that basically it is convenient for banks which have overlapping, uh, let's say, distribution networks maybe to, uh, you know, uh, mm. uh, to buy. So we, maybe you go through a, a first wave of consolidation which is mainly domestic, which reduces excess capacity, and then you have a second stage in which yeah. maybe you could have more cross-border. Well, uh, as we've seen, uh, the number of cross-border M&A transactions in the last few years has been almost nil. Mm. And it's interesting, if you read the research that was published yesterday around the merger, well, the, merger, the potential interest of Unicredit um, to uh, enter into talks with Commerzbank, it's interesting because the reasons why analysts mm, think that is possible is all the reasons that we have stated make it impossible. In other words, Unicredit's local, that's what the analysts say, but Unicredit's Germany subsidiary has a 20% capital adequacy. They have not been able to repatriate the capital back to Italy. So one way of using that capital is to put it to work locally. A second one, re-domiciling or having more activities in Germany relative to being perceived as an Italian bank will mean a significant drop in financial cost, et cetera, et cetera. So the reasons that analysts seem uh, you know, possible or, or, or the analysts seem the, the, f trying to find the reasons around going, you know, trying to solve all these impediments that we are talking about. All right? So the fact that in resolution you find mostly do domestic banks participating is because of these same problems. If I buy a bank in, if I'm a German bank or a French bank and I, the ban I, and I, f I buy a bank <coughs> in Spain, I will still have to have headquarters and everything there. I am not, if I, if I have uh, different activities in different regions in Spain, I have one headquarters and regional headquarters, which are very, very small. That's the way it should work in Europe. That's the way it works in the US. That's not the way it works today in Europe. MPLs, uh, well, our experience, we uh, bought Popular on the 7th of June and on the uh, 7th of August, exactly two months later, we disposed of 30 billion of non-performing loans in the largest uh, non-performing loan sale in Europe. I'm not saying, this is not to say that Popular couldn't have done it, right? But it is very difficult for banks which are in stress, which have limited capital, to dispose of these assets very quickly. For us, it was almost immediate. For weaker banks, getting rid of non-performing loans takes time, takes more time. Fintechs, well again, if we end up competing in the same regulatory framework, we feel fine. We, we don't feel threatened by competitors uh, working under the same, working with the same rules, right? So again, we invest a lot, we embrace new technologies, we now use blockchain uh, for many different purposes, some to improve our customers' experience when they send monies from Spain to Mexico, for instance. Now, after the earthquake in Mexico, the fact that we had this uh, blockchain technology is allowing donations in Spain to fly to Mexico immediately. Well, before it would have taken a few days, it would have cost much more money. So clearly we are enhancing uh, customer experience and embracing these new technologies. At the same time, um, it is helping us cut costs quite significantly. So, so clearly we are embracing these, these technologies. Now, in terms of competitors, if we all compete with the same rules, we feel fine. We, you know, we will have to do things better. They will force uh, us to do things better. Competition is good and we embrace competition. We like competition. Uh, finally, um, there are very, um, asking, uh, you ask about things that we would recommend that we try to put as priorities. Every, everything related to banking union, single deposit insurance, etc., is that's key. Right, it's absolutely key. Uh, there are all the, many other different regulations, mortgage laws, bankruptcy laws, 
employment laws. I mean, if, if we are going to manage our people in Europe as we manage our people in Spain or as we manage our people in Brazil, we need exactly the same rules, labor, labor uh, uh, rules, et cetera, et cetera. So it is very complex. So, but let's not, not put, let's as not put, you know, too ambitious goals in the near term. But for us, the key is to continue working on the banking union and the three, four pieces of the banking union. Thank you, Haki, before we open. Yeah, I agree with majority of the comments already presented, but there's, I would also raise another angle in a way that sort of what is similar and what is not. And as I said, that I, I think that the rules should be the same, irrespective of sort of bank or country or whatever, sort of that we play with the same set of rules. But at the same time, we have to accept that there are also differences sort of in terms of market, environment, and banks. And to me, sort of, if you look at the systemic issues, I would say that the first line of defense for sort of having stability in the financial system is that you have profitable banks. And that is naturally not the case in a way that we have sort of evenly spread profitability across the Europe right now. And then sort of there's probably worth taking a look at that, what are the historical reasons or sort of cultural or whatever reasons, uh, differences in the sort of local uh, legal frameworks and all those leading to a situation where we have such differing uh, profitability among different banks. And then looking at another angle that Okay, I occasionally hear sort of complaints that why are, for example, the risk weights uh, among different Nordic, uh, European banks so different and why do the Nordic banks have so low risk weight, as an example. But if we look at the statistics for MPLs, loan losses and all that, so we can see that there are huge differences. So we should accept that uh, we should have same set of rules. We should have uh, risk-based metrics for capital rules, for example, but then accepting that there are differences in between different markets. And looking at that angle as an example, the discussion around Basel IV is uh, somehow sort of a bit uh, weird in a way, as we say that we have to have rules which are risk sensitive, we have to have capital rules which are risk sensitive, and at the same time we are saying that we want to have output flows. So if and when we hopefully can trust that we have a robust system, for example, <coughs> reviewing the internal models through dream exercises and all these. So why would we then need output flaws? It's sort of saying that as we don't trust that the system works, then we have to have some other measures. So I would advocate that we, we have level playing field, same set of rules, but we also understand that there are differences and then work with those. Okay, thank you very much. So I see already hands raising in the, in the, in the floor. So let me, I think that...